Welcome. Today, a new militancy in the fight against global warming, civil disobedience at the White House. We'll also hear about a newly discovered fortune in dark money that environmentalists have been up against for years. Also on the program today, the Internet battlefield. Can China's hackers really get our electrical grid hacked and more? Why would they? And can our own hackers hack back? And should they? And we hear some original thinking about gentrification. Some stable, diverse neighborhoods are already occurring naturally, but can they become the norm in New York City? And despite the blinding glitter of the Oscars, we stare directly into this year's winners for cultural clues to the era we live in. First, though, global warming. Ten days ago, about 40,000 demonstrators gathered at the National Mall in Washington demanding President Obama take stronger action against climate change and reject the Keystone XL pipeline. Some of the demonstrators chained themselves to the White House gate. Climate activist Bill McKibben got arrested. So did lawyer Robert F. Kennedy Jr., NASA climate scientist James Hansen, director of the Sierra Club Michael Broon, and civil rights leader Julian Bond, among others. The protests were organized by 350.org, a relatively new organization which our guest, Phil Aronayanu, helped to found with McKibben. Phil is U.S. campaign director for 350.org and is helping to lead the growing student divestment movement. Journalist Suzanne Goldenberg joins us as well, correspondent for the British newspaper, The Guardian. She writes that environmentalists are up against a mint of opposition funding, funding disinformation about climate change. She joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And Phil, people have heard of the Sierra Club, they've heard of Greenpeace, a lot have not yet heard of 350.org. So what is it? 350.org is a movement or organization. It grew out of a small group of students um, who really wanted to make a difference. We linked up with uh, Bill McKibben and we created this organization that works in 188 countries around the world. 350 is a reference to? 350 is the safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere according to scientist Jim Hansen in parts per million. It's a concentration. And what is it now? Uh, we are at about 393 parts per million in the atmosphere. So it needs to come down, in your opinion? That's right. It needs to come back down. What did you accomplish at this demonstration at the White House and with your colleagues getting arrested? Well, I think the arrests are one piece of a multifaceted strategy. Um, and it's not just a strategy that includes you know, civil rights leaders and movement leaders. It's also a strategy that includes students all over the country. Um, students who are really concerned about their future. Uh, and we're bringing that moral case right to the leader's doorsteps. So divestment. You want who to stop investing in oil companies? Well, I think we've taken a lot of inspiration from social movements in the past. One of those movements is the South African anti-apartheid movement. During that movement, students here in the United States pitched in by getting their universities and colleges to divest stocks and bonds that were part of their endowment from those companies that were doing business in South Africa. Is it working? Are some schools actually divesting? Yep. We have three schools that already divested, Sterling College in Vermont, Unity College in Maine, and Hampshire College in Massachusetts. And we have campaigns running on 250 plus campuses around the country. Small, but it's a start. It's a start. Uh, Suzanne, speaking of money, what's Phil up against here? Tell us about your reporting in The Guardian. Well, he's up a big money. I mean, basically, um, what we did is we went back and, and sort of looked through tax returns for this big uh, organization that really uh, had been flying under the radar for um, more than a decade. And that's something called Donors Trust. And basically, what we've discovered is something like an ATM magazine, ATM machine. For, for the right, for, for conservatives. And in particular, what they've been doing is funneling money in secretive channels towards groups that deny the science behind global warming or that try and stop action against uh, global warming. So we're talking about $146 million uh, over the last decade that has gone to you know think tanks, activists, individuals, so-called scholars, all you know, with the common purpose of trying to block any kind of action on, on climate change. I want to put up a graphic from Greenpeace, which will really let our viewers see the rise of this group, Donors Trust, compared to some of the groups that our viewers may assume 
are funding the anti uh, fight and climate change uh, movement. Um, you could see the bottom, the black field down there, is ExxonMobil and the amount that they've spent over time from 2002 to 2010, pretty stable, even decreasing. The orange field up from that is the money that the Koch brothers have been spending um, to uh, discredit the idea of climate change. And then, wow, look at that huge green mountain there and how it increases over time. And that comes from donors' trust. So, Suzanne, basically everybody watching has heard of ExxonMobil. Uh, most people watching know about the Koch brothers by now. How is donors' trust throwing so much money at this, managing to fly so much below the radar? Because that's the exact reason why Donors Trust was created. It was created so that conservative billionaires could funnel money towards their pet causes and the rest of us wouldn't know the money was going there. It was set up specifically to allow them anonymity, right? So, mm -hmm. And we don't know. I mean, that some of that money that we see in the Donors Trust category, that could be coming from the Cokes. The whole point is we don't know where that money is coming from, but it's from a collection of wealthy individuals who want to uh, have some kind of influence but don't want to be known. But you do know where the money is going, right? Yeah, <laughs> you do know where the money is going. And some of these organizations are big, well-known think tanks like the American Enterprise Institute. But there's a lot of them that people have probably never heard of or may have only heard of very recently. And these smaller groups are very active. Some of them are focused almost exclusively on climate change. And some of them get really a large chunk of their budget from the, uh, this pile of anonymous donations. You know, you've got the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, which puts out this website that basically attacks climate scientists like Jim Hansen. They attack him regularly. Well, the organization behind that gets roughly about half of its budget from anonymous donations. So, Phil, how do you fight this kind of money? when you don't have the same amount of money. I'm assuming you don't have the same amount of money. Not even close. Uh, you know, I think what we're seeing is that there's this movement that's diverse, uh, that's broad-based, and that takes advantage of the internet to connect people. Uh, we work in 188 countries. We certainly don't have staff in 188 countries. These are volunteer leaders who are, this is their issue. Many of them are young people, because young people, again, understand that this is their future that they're walking into. So we're connecting leaders from indigenous communities, from communities dealing with mountaintop removal, coal mining, fr from extraction fights, from refining communities in, uh, on the coast of Texas, and knitting them together into this powerful movement that we think with spirit and energy um, and votes can counter the fossil fuel industry. And increasing militancy, would you use that word? I don't know if I'd use militancy. This movement is very much in the tradition of the civil rights movement and Gandhi. Um, it's, not, it's a nonviolent movement. But I would say that this movement is escalating. It's becoming more interested in pushing up against the power structures that are keeping climate, uh, effective climate legislation and clean energy from spreading. How good public relations for your cause, even though it was a disaster for our area, was Sandy? And how much can something like Sandy can Sandy in particular counter some of the money from groups like Donors Trust? It's hard to put a number on it, but I would say that Sandy definitely woke people up. I mean, power went out in the wealthiest area of the wealthiest city of the wealthiest country in the world for multiple days because of the storm surge. It was higher than any of the scientists expected. Um, and I think it woke a lot of people up. But the real thing is that we need to do, do good by the people who were impacted by Sandy, many of them low-income folks who were living out in the Rockaways. They understand climate change more than almost any of us do. Sandy, I'm, I'm curious, um, at The Guardian, have you done reporting, or have you, Suzanne, I'm sorry, have done reporting um, on what I heard from China this week, which is that they are actually imposing a carbon tax, uh, something that the United States democracy can't get through. This uh, authoritarian technocracy, if I can call it that, is imposing on its own. Uh, have you looked at the China thing? Do you think it's real? I think it. I think probably it is real. I haven't covered China closely until recently. We had uh, an environment correspondent based in China who reported 
only on environmental matters. So I'm relying on his work here. But, um, you know, China has been taking steps over time, not big steps, not as much as is needed, but to reduce what they call their energy intensity. So they want to continue to grow their economy, to, but to do that in a less polluting way. Um, and I think that's pretty real because I think they know that they cannot continue to uh, make people sick uh, with the air pollution that you see in big cities like Beijing. Right, so I and think that's sort of the equivalent of their yeah. Sandy over there recently, I guess, is these unbelievably yeah. choking air polluted days that are really present in people's daily experience in Beijing and some other cities. And so uh, my sense is that they felt a need to respond to that at the policy level. It's unfortunate that so often in environmental issues it takes some kind of crisis uh, in order to get the policy world to respond. And let's finish up on that point, Phil. President Obama in the State of the Union address said if Congress won't take action on climate change, there are things he can do under the law unilaterally. Can you name the top two or three things that you would like him to do? Absolutely. Well, the number one thing, the litmus test about uh, on his uh, commitment to climate is rejecting the Keystone XL pipeline. It would take the equivalent of six million cars off the road in terms of carbon emissions. Now, there's all sorts of other things that he could do, you know, uh, invest in clean energy in a, in a real way, uh, cut emissions from existing coal-fired power plants. All of those pieces are extremely important and need to happen. But as Bill likes to say, Bill McKibben likes to say, uh, the first rule of holes is that when you're in a hole, you have to stop digging. And to stop digging, he needs to reject this pipeline. And to the people who say, this oil is coming from Canada, Canada, if they can't send it down to the United States, they're in fact going to send it to China uh, unless their own environmentalists stop them from building the pipeline west. But can you really reduce carbon emissions just by blocking it in the United States? Absolutely. This is an export pipeline. There's no two ways about it. They're going to try to get the oil to China. We have allies in the First Nations communities and all throughout British Columbia who are fighting tooth and nail to stop the pipeline out west. We have communities in Portland, Maine who are stopping the pipeline to go east. We really, uh, the Keystone Pipeline really is the only straw to this massive carbon pool. And if we stop it, it's not going anywhere. Thanks for joining us. Thank and you. Suzanne, thank you. Up next, another China angle, China's state-sponsored hacking. Is it cyber war? Last week, U.S.-based cybersecurity firm Mandiant released damning evidence that the Chinese military has been behind hacking attempts on U.S. corporations over the past several years. Security analysts say it's just a matter of time before key infrastructure here is affected. The alarm bell has been rung, putting the U.S. and China on what appears to be a kind of Cold War collision course but in cyberspace. So what is motivating this hacking? Who exactly are the hackers? And is the U.S. doing enough, or too much, to protect our critical infrastructure? Joining us, Wall Street Journal online editor Steve Rosenbush, and via Skype, computer security expert and author Bruce, Bruce Schneier. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And Bruce, let me start with you. Um, you've been critical of some of the language that the media has been using with respect to this discovery by Mandian. You don't like the term cyber warfare for this, do you? Uh, I don't. I think warfare is a very particular term. And when we use war, when we don't mean war, it very much colors the debate and it colors our policy. Right? What this is is espionage. And it's been going on since the beginning of time. It goes on during wartime and during peacetime. It's serious, but it's, it's not war. How clear is it to you who is spying on whom if it's espionage? Well, to be clear, everyone's spying on everybody. I mean, what's precipitating this particular media frenzy is a report of Chinese military spying. And the evidence is actually pretty good here. Uh, it, it can be hard to trace attacks, especially hard in the moment. But this research was done over a long period of time. The attackers made some key mistakes. And we actually know where this particular incident is coming from. Now, there's spying attacks happening everywhere, so there's a lot more than this. But this is definitely a Chinese attack against U.S. companies, governments, media. Explain that. Why would the Chinese military be looking at the private sector in this country? You know, the same reason the U.S. military looks at the private sector in China. 
you know, the, the difference between private and military is very blurred. Uh, quite a lot of our defense budget goes to private companies. A lot of our important secrets are economic secrets. So it's, it's you know, the economy, the world is so integrated that you can't separate very cleanly military from non-military. And it's not just China. Again, everybody does it. So, Steve, you've been reporting on the defense side of this. Where do you begin? Well, I, I think that you need to look at the problem as, as a technological problem, but also uh, a problem uh, of management and, and control and, and just general uh, habit of mind. I'll, I'll share um, a bit of reporting um, from, you know, from our notebooks over the last week. I, I heard the other day about a utility that ran a test, um, and it, it took 20 USB sticks and it just scattered them on the floor and waited to see what would happen. And within an hour, employees had picked up all 20 USB sticks. And now some B, of them these sticks? Thumb drives or the, the little... Um, like flash drive? Exactly, uh -huh. flash drives. And you know, within an hour, they were all gone. And sometime you know, before the end of the day, many of those drives had been actually connected to the computer. And you know, I think that what that, that really tells you a lot about the state of um, the defense of, of utility networks in particular and, and corporate networks and industrial networks in general. Um, you know, a lot of the problems are as much about habit and, and lack of awareness as, as anything else. And as far as the threats go that are out there, um, you know, you have to assume that most, if not all, uh, corporate networks are a contested ground. Um, Bruce Schneier. Does the U.S. government embrace the hacking community here to help build defenses, what we loosely refer to as the hacking community, the so-called white hat or good guy hackers? I don't know if you include the group Anonymous. Uh, there was, you know, the protest recently uh, after the suicide of Aaron Swartz, who may have gone in that category. Is there an opportunity being missed here to connect the grassroots online community in this country with uh, the government and industry for defensive purposes? Yeah, I don't think so. They're, they're, they're being, well, I think we, we, are, we are doing that. There's a lot of conferences where government and independent hackers get together. There's a lot of dialogue. Uh, people are teaching each other. It's not like the government saying, well, you guys were teenagers once, so we're never going to speak to you. Uh, the U.S. Cyber Command, the U.S. government recognizes that offense and skills are valuable. And, and often today's unruly teenagers are, you know, have tomorrow's jobs and are doing cybersecurity. So I don't think we're missing anything there. Uh, I mean, the Chinese are doing this too. They, in addition to government-sponsored hacking, there are independent hacker groups operating in China that basically hack with impunity. They know they, they find anything good, they pass it to their handlers. So kind of everybody's sort of using all the tools. Can, Steve, defense be mounted? against cyber espionage? Or is it a losing battle, a cat and mouse game, that ultimately everybody's going to learn everything about everybody else's computer if they try hard enough? Well, it, it, I would say it's probably neither, neither one. You, you can absolutely mount a better defense. You, you can't really mount a perfect defense, but we can do better than we are, better than we are right now. The, the, the intensity of attacks isn't going to isn't going to ebb uh, over over the foreseeable future, but we can become much much better at, at defending at defending our networks and also remediating the problems that that exist now. Are you familiar with the concept of air gap? Yes. Tell us about what that means. Well, the in the industrial world in particular, um, and especially in, in utility networks, the the production side of the of the network is supposed to be isolated completely from the corporate or the day to day business side of the network. And the idea is that you isolate the production systems from the internet, which is, you know, we all know, you know, is a source of, um, you know, endless cyber threat. Uh, the, the problem is that those, those networks, while, you know, they are separate in theory, are, are bridgeable um, in any number of ways. You know, you, you have the need to upgrade software on, on the production side of the network. So, you know, out of, for, for the sake of convenience, you take a laptop that you use at home or you know in the the business office and you you bring it to the production network the policy says you shouldn't do that but it's not always adhered to first i wonder what you think this is leading to um, you talked about the term cyber 
war and why you don't like the media using it right now. I was in China late last year on a tour for journalists, and one of the things that I kept hearing from people of all kinds of political persuasions was that China is not interested in the least in war against the United States. They may be somewhat belligerent right now in their own region, uh, pushing against their neighbors for natural resources and things like that, but they're not expansionist uh, fundamentally, and the last thing they're interested in is provoking the United States into some kind of war. So what would all this cyber espionage against the U.S. be leading to, in your opinion? Well, I think it's leading to a bunch of things. I mean, when China attacked the New York Times, they were looking for the names of media informants. They were looking for people to arrest. So they might be looking for economic advantage or political advantage. I mean, the same reason we all spy on each other, to gain some advantage. And what it's leading to, I think, is a world of far fewer secrets. I mean, yes, there's a lot more we can do for security, but in the end, the attacker has the advantage. Right? Steve mentioned the USB trick. There are a lot of tricks to get into networks. Uh, U.S. has air gap networks where attackers breach because some general makes a mistake and plugs a computer in wrong. You know, it, it is so easy now to break into systems. And while there's a lot more we can do, I think we want to recognize that we're going to live in a world with fewer secrets, that in a sense, WikiLeaks is correct. As long as secrets are out there, someone can breach them, and when they're breached, there's no getting back. My fear is this is leading to a cyber war arms race, that we're looking for an escalation of rhetoric and spending on all sides, and that's going to make us less safe. And that's probably my biggest fear of what's coming. So is the U.S. doing this to China at the same level that China is doing it to the United States? We just don't hear about it as much? So we don't know. This is all secret. Uh, we know the U.S. Cyber Command is staffing up from 900 people to about 5,000 people. We know they do offense and defense. We know that they're run by General Keith Alexander, who also runs the National Security Agency. The assumption is we're giving as good as we're getting, but, you know, it's all in secrecy. We don't know. There's also this controversial uh, law called CISPI's uh, uh, Cyber Intelligence Sharing Protection Act, Sharing and Protection Act. I'm going to say that again, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, CISPA. Are you concerned about CISPA or encouraging CISPA? So, I mean, in these laws, the devil's in the details. And whenever I read them, they can be either good or bad depending on how they're implemented. Uh, CISPA, by and large, seems like a good thing. Information sharing is valuable uh, for a lot of reasons. As researchers, we like it. As practitioners, we like it. As defenders, we like it. So anything that helps that is good. You know, there are some issues about some of the privacy provisions, but there are going to be issues even without the bill. So on the whole, I think it's a good thing. Steve, uh, do the people you talk to for your reporting uh, say anything about CIS CISPA, pro or con? Uh, the, I think that more, more um, over, oversight uh, at the industrial level and the government level is, you know, necessary and that it, it's widely supported. The only, once in a while you run into people who think that um, too much emphasis on security will uh, slow down operation of, of business. And sometimes it's viewed as, as, a, as a liability in a sense from, from the business standpoint. Is there a worst case scenario in your article that we should know about? Well, the, the worst case scenario um, would probably involve critical infrastructure like like the utility network, there's always uh, you know, some. You, you asked about you know, why why a government, whether it's China or, or any other other government, would want to inflict serious damage on on the the electric grid in the U.S. There, there's very little economic benefit, but there could be strategic benefit if, you know, God forbid, war broke out, a shooting war broke out between the U.S. and another country. At that point, there might be some tactical advantage in in trying to. Uh, at least divert attention or or uh, slow down the, the ability of the U.S. to respond militarily. That's if there really is a war, yes. right? And that's just war as it always was. We were bombing bridges once upon yes. a time during wartime to destroy infrastructure. Today you would do some of that online. But in terms of the espionage itself, uh, it's there's no... Um, 
necess there isn't necessarily damage to the greater community in the United States unless a war does break out? Well, if we're talking about worst case scenarios and we're talking about um, the escalation of, of cyber attacks, I would say that you know, those, th those two uh, vectors are, are closely related and that they would, they would escalate um, sort of in unison. So Bruce, we're just about out of time, but in a soundbite, how would we know when we cross the threshold from cyber security, uh, cyber espionage to cyber war? When your brother comes home in a body bag, that's war. We know what war looks like. Right? It, it, I mean, it's war will include cyberspace like it includes air and sea and land, but it's actual war. There's bombings, there's invasions. You know, other than that, we're preparing the battlefield. That's what it's called. We did it with Russia. We're doing it with China. We're probably doing it with other countries as well. We are not at war today. Let's not get overexcited about some of these reports in the media, as our guests have advised, but obviously a good thing to keep our eyes on. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Up next, New York's changing neighborhoods, gentrification or integration. Take a walk through Harlem or other New York neighborhoods like Fort Greene or Bed-Stuy. And what we used to think of as traditionally black areas are now noticeably mixed residential oases in an increasing number of cases. Some take these changes for granted already, but as our next guests remind us, they were not predicted. Here to help us measure just how far we've come and whether these three neighborhoods uh, are the vanguard of a future truly integrated city are sociologists John Mollenkopf, director of the Center for Urban Research and a distinguished professor at the CUNY Graduate Center, and Sharon Zukin, she is a professor at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center and author of Naked City, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places. Welcome. What's happening? Well, a combination of things are happening. Uh, the crime rate has gone down. The uh, subway system has improved. Uh, the level of racial tension in the city has subsided somewhat from its peaks. Uh, the investment in neighborhoods has been growing uh, over the years. So uh, people feel freer to live in different places than they might have 20 or 30 years ago. And, and let's see how that's represented on a census map. We're going to put up a very interesting map on the screen. This is New York City census map broken down by race, changes from 2000 to 2010. And Professor Mollenkopf, I'll stay with you on this for the moment. Uh, tell us what we're looking at now. Orange represents where African Americans are the majority, right? Right. Well, and the, the hues, uh, the, the colors depend on which group is predominant. And then the, the brightness, the intensity of the colors represents the percentage uh, of, of whatever is the dominant group. And essentially, you see uh, in, in Harlem more areas uh, becoming uh, places where, where whites are living, and the percentage uh, concentration of African Americans gradually declining over time. So as we move this across time, we see the orange areas becoming lighter orange, which means they're still predominantly African American, but not as much. Exactly. Uh, the green areas are predominantly Latino. Those don't seem to be changing very much. The blue areas, Upper West Side there on the left. Well, some of the areas that are changing least are maybe housing projects or uh, Mitchell Lama projects and so forth, where the tendency is tends to be very long term. If people have good stabilized rent. So, by the same token, as we learned from the New York Times uh, this morning, uh, the public housing tenancy in East Harlem is becoming more Asian, and uh, I, I believe there are some uh, recent college graduates. Uh, not black, whose uh, parents are investing in apartments for them in Mitchell Lama housing projects. So there are various ways mm -hmm. that uh, the, the uh, racial and ethnic complexion of different neighborhoods is changing. So to stay on Harlem, um, I mean, really to stay on Manhattan, it looks like it's mostly one way, despite those examples that you just gave. We don't see predominantly white or even for that matter, predominantly Latino neighborhoods. 
um, having a lot of African Americans move in. What we seem to see... we do see other people moving yes. in. It, it, yes. The black neighborhoods are getting less monolithically black and the white neighborhoods are getting less monolithically white. More it, Asian in particular? Asian and Latino, yes. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, look at the financial district. A lot of Asians and Asian Americans have moved into what is the most rapidly growing residential neighborhood in Manhattan and perhaps even in, in New York City. Uh, and of course, with continued immigration, uh, many more people are coming from every region of the world. So is this integration in the sense of people really living with all kinds of people side by side and mixing? Or is this what we've often seen in New York, block by block differences, but not really mixed? Well, there is certainly co-presence. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what integration uh, would, would be because there are so many strategies for creating little cocoons in the city and little places where uh, you and your children mix with others very much like yourselves. On the other hand, uh, we have so many public spaces in New York where people do mix, and John is completely correct that racial etiquette has changed greatly since the early 1990s, so that uh, I think people, especially young people in New York, are much more comfortable in ethnically mixed circumstances than they ever were before. And I think there are some you know, bars, restaurants, clubs, and things where, where uh, different groups are, are mixing more than they might in the daycare center or... Uh, How do you measure that as a sociologist? Well, you follow Sharon's lead and you go out and do good <laughs> ethnography, I think. Is there, we don't have a census of uh, social networks or, or social capital, unfortunately. I'm sure there were people, sociologists who would be thrilled to have one. Um, but given the lack of any syst systematic measurements, uh, you have to go out and take a look and, and embed yourself in the situation and see how people are interacting. I'm glad John mentioned restaurants because I've been looking at restaurants in Bed-Stuy and uh, trying to, to understand the, uh, the social strategies of the owners as well as the customers. Uh, there are uh, some very upscale bars and uh, restaurants and cafes in Bed-Stuy now compared to uh, the fast food places and um, uh, rib joints, barbecue places, and uh, very cheap takeout places, and, uh, both Chinese and Caribbean as well as other, other types. Uh, the question is, are these racially mixed restaurants, bars, and cafes, uh, primarily black space or white space? Or are they in some ways post-racial space? Even though we know in the United States there are extreme inequalities between blacks and non-blacks. What's the answer to your question, as well, far as you can tell? Uh, I, I have an end of one. I, I visit Peaches from time to time. Okay, That's Peaches probably one of those one places. Of your yeah. sites. Of one, one place. Uh, and <laughs> It's, it's very interesting. I'd say it's about three quarters to four fifths African American, but African American and Afro Caribbean. Mm -hmm. I think the people that own it might be Afro Caribbean. Mixed. Uh, and uh, a lot of, you know, families going there Sunday after church, but also a certain number of the young people, young white people who've moved into, into Bed Stuy, and then people like myself who just like it and get on their bicycle and ride over from Park Slope. You were quoted recently saying about this uh, trend of whites moving into Harlem and Bed-Stuy in particular, it has not occasioned racial conflict. We don't have blacks saying we don't want whites moving into our neighborhoods. We see whites getting along with their black neighbors. They're not freaked out by the fact that they're a minority in their new neighborhoods, these white people. And this is something urban sociologists would not have predicted was possible. What would the prediction have been? Well, the, the pa people predict from past trends, and the past trends up until fairly recently were uh, of, gr of growing separation, and whites seeing black neighborhoods as being dangerous, and, and blacks seeing white neighborhoods as, as quite possibly dangerous to them also. And um, we, 
like the fall of the Berlin Wall, I, I think the, the, not to say there's an exact analogy, racism is still a potent force in our society, but it's, the rough edges have been sanded off in some way. And there's a, especially I think because um, the, the whole of the city has become a safer place. Uh, and people are just more comfortable in, in being in somewhat strange circumstances because they have this underlying belief that, it, that it's probably safe for them to be there. Whereas the supposition in the past might have been, this is probably a dangerous place, I should, I should not go there. Yes, that, that's definitely true. The, the decline in crime rates is absolutely key to uh, our perceptions of, of changed neighborhoods. Um, at, the, at the same time, I, I think that uh, two or three generations have uh, come to maturity after the civil rights movement and the, uh, uh, the um, uh, inclusion of many more non-white people of all, of all kinds into major institutions, uh, plus uh, 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 people have grown up with uh, uh, black stars of uh, pop culture, television shows. Uh, 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 after the election of President Obama, uh, I, I noticed a dramatic increase in the number of black actors who were shown in mainstream television mm -hmm. commercials. It's not as though there were none before, but there, there is a visibility of, uh, of, of the rainbow coalition that there wasn't back in the 1980s or 1990s. And, and uh, you know, there have been very serious demographic changes, um, not all of which are as happy as, um, as new immigration. The incarceration of many blacks uh, the, the severe drug laws that have um, taken many people from communities, the people who have died from crack cocaine. Uh, I, I, I think that um, both white and black populations are less dangerous, as John says, for a variety of reasons. So mostly positive trends mm. that you're speaking of, yes. but at the community level, it, this is more optimistic, what you guys are saying, than what we often here as a media narrative, which is that there's a gentrification taking place mm. uh, that involves mostly white, middle, or upper middle class people moving into historically African American neighborhoods and, in effect, pushing people out well, that's who true don't too. have quality <laughs> places to go. Well, and at, so is uh, is the is is whites moving into black neighborhoods the moral equivalent just, of the integration that people used to talk about in the 50s and 60s, which was allowing blacks to move into white neighborhoods? Mm. Just because one group is waxing and another waning doesn't mean that necessarily that one is pushing another out. If you think of the community of African Americans who came north from the American South that, that essentially founded. Uh, Bed-Stuy, um, there's been a, an aging of those, you know, the, the original founding generation probably is at the end of uh, its life course, and there, many of their children may be nearing retirement age, and a lot of those people are thinking, well, you know, at, in my third age, it's nicer to be in North Carolina than it is to be in Brooklyn, and the, the African-American population of New York City has been declining and it's I think it's only partly because of you know real estate pressures and some of those people have benefited from the rise of the real estate mm. prices and they can live they can sell a Brooklyn brownstone in Bed-Stuy for seven hundred thousand dollars and and to buy a house that's even nicer for much cheaper in North exactly. Carolina. Took the words out of my mouth there. Well, that's absolutely Ch true. And, displacement, and displacement is not necessarily a collective effort that is consciously right. decided on and, you know, marshaled as a, no, it's as a, a battle plan. A house at a time, a, it, an apartment at a time. Yeah. The city is constant in its change. Exactly. Thank you very Thank much you. for chronicling some of it with us today. And up next, reflections of the real America in the Oscar winners. In 1956, Allied Artists released Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You may know the film or the remake. It tells the story of an extraterrestrial invasion of a small California town where the invaders replace the residents with duplicates that are devoid of individuality or emotion. Some interpret the film as a cautionary tale about communism. 
Others say it was an allegory about McCarthyism. But no question, it was and remains culturally significant. It was selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the U.S. National Film Registry. After recovering from the Oscar extravaganza last weekend, we got to thinking, why in 2013 were we treated to films about racial revenge, the great emancipator, political revenge, Alzheimer's, escaping from Iran, love in a time of emotional recovery, and a kid in a boat with a tiger. What does that say about the era that we're living in today? And are any of these especially worth preserving in our time capsules? Joining us, Jim Hoberman, 33 years film critic for The Village Voice and author of Film After Film or What Became of 21st Century Cinema, and Lisa Schwartzbaum, former longtime movie critic at Entertainment Weekly magazine. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, and you wanted to say something right off the bat about the clip that we played? Yes, I wanted to, to make the point that although um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers seems almost too allegorical to us today, although it's, an, it's interesting because it's an allegory that, that can be read, as you said, as a, a, about the takeover of communism or the threat of McCarthyism, that when it came out, and it was certainly a small movie, that it wasn't even reviewed in the New York Times, um, that it, it was baffling. It was baffling. If you read the Variety Review, they don't get it. They don't get the premise. And it really was, uh, it took several years and um, some European uh, commentators or fringe commentators to, to begin to make this point. And of course, the filmmakers all deny that they were doing anything. Oh, we just wanted to entertain people and, and so on. So my point is that, that, that the allegory, if it exists, is not always evident at the moment that the movie right. appears. That's interesting. And that would have been a case of reverse commercialism if they were hiding the subtext uh, because, you know, they maybe they just wanted to make an alien movie. I don't know. Mm. Uh, but let's let's go to today and to take what might be a fairly narrow example before we get to the big picture of who we are as a culture. Um, I thought that Lincoln, as I saw it, was Steven Spielberg taking the opportunity to tell Obama to get a spine. <laughs> Do you think that was what was going on there? Uh, in that Spielberg was working on this movie for about at least half a dozen years, oh, if really? not more. Uh -huh. I think that it's more Steven Spielberg thinking about what's his legacy. He, Spielberg, taking into account how does, what, kind of, what kind of material does he want to handle. And of course, he can do any kind of material he wants. He can do blockbusters, he can do aliens. But I think, I think taking on, I think he is a political guy. I think actually he has a heart and he wanted to be smart. And I think actually in linking up with Tony Kushner, that is really his way of being smart and recognizing that the two of them can can bring history to people who don't know that story. Mm -hmm. So is it a coincidence, Jim, do you think that that landed in the same year as Tarantino's Django Unchained, and so we had these sort of, you know, from the halls of Congress to the uh, streets of uh, the Wild South kind of, uh, you know, emancipation films? Well, well, yes and no, because it's certainly true that movies can be in, pre in pre-production for a very long time. I think that it seems to me that, that, that uh, the election of uh, Barack Obama in, in 2008 must have been some kind of impetus for um, Spielberg to make the movie. I mean, after all, it, it came out also in an election year, although after the, the election. It was timed exactly. It was, yeah. once, it, once it was ready to go, it was timed. Yeah. He did not want it to come out before the election as if it were a vote for yeah. something, but to come out afterwards but, as... Where you know we're, than that. we're thinking about this stuff, and and um, uh, I think that that uh, you know Obama's presence certainly is going to have an effect on the way that on the way that people think. Takes takes a little while. I mean, I think that we were having Bush movies. That's right. You know, uh, mm -hmm. up until very recently, and and that this year there were a, a bunch of movies which we can think of as Obama movies and and, and we had Mrs. Obama that, yeah. you know really which is which <laughs> right. is an important part of it I mean that actually yeah. the Obamas were integrated into Oscar history yeah. by having Michelle Obama so there. do we see the progression from Bush movie the Hurt Locker about the Iraq war to 
Obama movie by the same director, Ooh. Zero Dark Thirty? Uh, yes, I think that, 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 that there's uh, uh, something that can be said for that. Of course, the uh, uh, Zero Dark Thirty mutated. I mean, it actually was changed under the pressure of events. I mean, that, that, that uh, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bowles were already making a, a bin Laden movie, and then suddenly <laughs> bin Laden was killed, and they changed the uh, I guess uh, the they movie. had to. <laughs> what do we do with our script that, now? That, well, but, you know, the thing that's so, that's so interesting about, uh, maybe we want to, we could spend the whole time yeah, on, I think on we the need reaction. To be, I think we need to be bigger than Zero Dark Thirty. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I just want to mention one thing. When we, we started talking about this, about how this reflects our culture, and one of the things that I think is the most interesting thing about the Oscars every year is that it's actually a snapshot of how Hollywood looks at itself. So it's not even representing the bigger culture, it's mm -hmm. Hollywood culture mm -hmm. and how they want to be thought of. And um, one of the reasons that Argo might have won is because Hollywood saves the day in Argo. Hollywood comes through and and frees it's its the own, hostages. It's its own hero. Yes. That's, right. That's right. And, and there's something, you know, it's the same way that the documentary is the feel-good documentary happened to be the one that won. Yet the subjects they're covering are, you know, rape in the military and, and, and um, you Middle know, gay East. activism, exactly, mm -hmm. that Hollywood wants to think of itself in a nice way. You know, these are people with pride and egos. And when it comes to the actual choosing of what they think is important, I think you cannot leave that out, their own self-preservation. Yeah. I mean, something that was interesting this year, and I don't, I don't remember this ever being the case, where the trades, Hollywood Reporter and Variety, were really reporting on the, on the Oscar race like it was a political race. I mean, it started off with Zero Dark Thirty. Oh, that's the early, it's like, as if they won the caucus is, is in, in, in Iowa. And then, uh -huh. you know, uh, and then Lincoln opened, and that was, that, you know, uh, won the New Hampshire primary. But, but I think that, um, the minute that the Congress got interested in uh, Zero Dark Thirty, it lost any chance of getting an Oscar because the industry sort of yeah. hardwired to be afraid of right. that. And, and yet when I saw Michelle yeah. Obama come out yeah. to deliver the award, I thought, wait a minute, and this was a completely crazy yeah. thought, but I thought, wait a minute, is it going to be Zero Dark Thirty after all? So they can say Obama was reelected and bin Laden is dead. That's so funny you say that because I thought it couldn't possibly be Zero Dark Thirty if she's presenting because she wouldn't want to get anywhere near right. it. My thinking but you're, was, I think you're right. My thinking actually. was, oh, it must be Lincoln because I know they <laughs> saw it in the White House. So it's, they showed it several times. They I did. mean, they showed That's it right. repeatedly in the White House. This still doesn't answer the question yeah. of the kid in a boat with a tiger, however, which yeah. I, I don't understand. I mean. I haven't seen that movie, so. I well, how about this. how about the ones that go into our personal lives, Amour, or um, the uh, uh, Silver uh, Silver, Silver Linings Playbook, playbook mm -hmm. right. which you know I would I saw that movie not knowing what it was going to be about, and was a little surprised that here were people who had nervous breakdowns yeah, on illness. all kinds of drugs, mental right. illness, and this happened just after Newtown. You know, if there had been a gun in that plot, it really would have so reflected the you're the, the one times. who's making all yeah, these yeah. political but, connections. But, but may, maybe it's too much, but at least on a cultural level, people are living with mental illness, people are living with extreme anxiety, people are living with divorce and loss that came up, and adultery, which was the cause of the... Right, and the thing that was so interesting about that movie is that he managed to get all of these themes in and make it funny and make it serious and make it sad and make it happy and it never went in the direction you thought it was going to go. So he's taking on all of these kind of hot button issues and he's making a comedy out of people who are mentally ill and it's funny. And he's making a romance, an old fashioned romance out right. of people with, with right. conflict. But for a rom-com, it was mm -hmm. extremely anxiety producing, mm -hmm. and I thought. In and, a good way, no? And, Not for you in a yeah, good way. Yeah, well, mostly in a good way. Yeah. Okay. But it was, you know, it was like, Oh, we, are they going to lose it here? Right. You know, is somebody going to go off on somebody here? Uh -huh. At the same time that all the nice stuff was going on. But it, that one, I think, is really a cultural artifact that people will look back on 50 years from now, 100 years from now, and say, oh, these are the kinds of psychological and sociological mm -hmm. things that Americans were living with in their personal lives. Yes. I mean, go on. Oh, sorry. I mean, <laughs> Go ahead. Please. You could say that. Please. Lisa, go ahead. No, no. Yeah. no, I just wonder, you know, I was, I was thinking of... Uh, American Beauty in its time, when yeah. that movie came out, was, you know, it was, I mean, I'm not a big American Beauty fan, but I, the Silver Linings Playbook, yes, it says something right now about our time. Will it go in the time capsule? I don't think so. Will it be something where, like, is, is there anything that's invasion of the body snatchers worthy? Oh, I, I don't know, but, so, but in, terms of, in terms of, like, fraught 
uh, rom-coms. Yes. I would say that, that uh, so this is 40, although it's certainly a less um, engaging movie is, you know, has, has perhaps a, a, a more of a pathology that that will be illuminating in uh, 40 years or, you know, however right, long. Right. And Amor, does it intersect in any way with this conversation? I think anybody on the Academy either has parents who are going through this or are going through this themselves. We all will be going through this. We all have parents who have. So I think one of the reasons that it has struck such a chord is that it is so universal and, of course, that it's so beautifully made um, that he actually, you know, Michael Haneke is a guy who was often thought of as a sadistic filmmaker, as a mean filmmaker. And there was a, I think there was more of a heart to this than, than, than other things yeah. he's done. And just the universality of the, it. And, and on the um, health of movies as art form Ooh. today, going to the, to the theme of your book, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or one of them, I mean, I heard a casual reference on the Yankees spring training broadcast the other day. They were chatting about the Oscars because spring training games are boring. And Susan Waldman, their analyst, said, uh, Argo, yeah, probably best movie, but it wasn't Gone with the Wind. <laughs> yeah. Is that about where we are? I don't know. The Mets guys are always talking about movies, but they're talking about the old, old movies. Um, I, I think that actually the, the motion pictures or cinema as an art form is, is pretty healthy. I mean, I, that doesn't have to do with its, the place it has in the, in the culture, necessarily. And um, I think that its movies have been displaced. They were displaced by, by television in the 50s. They're, they're in the process and of being displaced. And again, still now. Yeah, I, by, 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 and, and by the, the internet and so on. But Netflix binge releases. Yeah, I think that there are things also, that there are things that are internal to the medium. There are conflicts in, and um, with, with. Take, uh, take Beasts of the Southern Wild, yeah, though, in the midst yeah, of that. Yeah. As something that came through, and also your your we were chatting with uh, uh, your previous guest about that as as an, a movie about the as an environmental movie. I mean that 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 Beast really oh yeah that that's that's very yes. topical in its in in its way as well. Yeah, uh, so yeah. it was a year of movies with a lot of heart, actually. Surprisingly, I think, it, yeah, yes. I think so. A year yeah. with more substance yeah. than we might have imagined. Yeah, we will see what 2013 brings. Thank you both. Okay, very much. thanks. thanks. And that's our program for this week. We premiere a new show each Wednesday evening at 7.30. Next week, a new allegedly safe kind of nuclear reactor that Bill Gates is pushing. And tune into my daily radio program, 10 a.m. till noon on WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow, countdown to the sequestration budget. What else? I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.